we have two speakers today covering uh, quite a diverse array of topics, which is terrific, both internal speakers. And I encourage people, if you have questions, type them into the chat, and then we'll get those questions answered when the talks are, are finished. So our first speaker is Antonio Omoro. You may, maybe you may know him. He, he is a professor of neurology and the chief of neuro-oncology here, and the clinical leader, uh, program leader of the Chenevere Family Can Brain Tumor Center, which is a new program here. He received his initial medical training in Brazil, then uh, worked at Memorial Stone Kettering for a while and began his faculty career at the University of Miami. He joined us in 2012. He's an international leader in the clinical care and research on brain tumors, um, leading, leading pivotal research programs and treatment of these cancers. The Chenevere Family Brain Tumor Center is a new Yale initiative for the comprehensive and multidisciplinary brain tumor care. And perhaps you might hear a little bit about that uh, from Antonio. So Antonio, the floor is yours. Thank you for speaking today. Thank you very much, Dan. Uh, so I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to talk to you today. And uh, for today specifically, I was asked to share with you what's happening in our division in terms of clinical trials and how we're tapping into the Yale talent to build our portfolio. But I would also like to share with you the state of our field and the spirit of uh, almost like an invitation to even more investigators and labs to join us in this task. So uh, today we're gonna concentrate on gliomas. And the reason for that is that they account for the vast majority of the brain tumors. And as you can see here, this is a pie chart showing all malignant intracranial tumors. And uh, the vast majority of the patients have either glioblastoma or other forms of gliomas, uh, which for the most part are IDH mutants, which account for grades two and three astrocytomas and grades two and three oligodendrogliomas. This is trailed by sinus lymphomas, meningiomas, and other rare tumors. But the bottom line here is that this, even the most common tumor, which is unfortunately the grade four glioma or glioblastoma, still is a relatively rare disease with only 3.1 patients for uh, each 100,000 people. So it is again, a relatively rare disease, fortunately, but it is, as you know, a very devastating disease. And the reason why this is such a challenging disease is that, you know, the anatomic location really doesn't help us. So these are patients that present with these large tumors with lots of surrounding uh, edema and infiltrative uh, microscopic disease. Uh, these tumors are highly vascularized. So we're at the same time dealing with an oncologic disease, but truly uh, we're dealing with a uh, neurologic disease as well. And you can imagine how challenging it is to manage all of these symptoms while you're still trying to make a difference in terms of oncologic treatments. And reflecting this challenge is the fact that the only drug that has shown to improve survival so far is this alkylate, alkylating agent that is more than 20 years old. So this is temozolomide and uh, in clinical trials, uh, here you're seeing that temozolomide improves both respiratory survival and overall survival. But even the experimental arm uh, in the pivotal trial, which was published uh, in 2005, uh, the median survival uh, remained only 15 months for, again, newly diagnosed disease. And further analysis of this data has shown that uh, the survival benefit is mostly uh, driven by tumors that have this epigenetic silencing of the MGMT gene promoter uh, by methylation. So these patients with methylated MGMT tend to respond better to temozolomide, but they account for only about 30% of the patients. So for the remainder of the patients, the only real treatment that is available is radiation. And we did try a lot of agents. And here you're looking at a slide from 2005 where we were talking about all of these clinical trials in glioblastoma and in other diseases, testing these novel target therapies. So we were very excited that uh, for the first time we would be able to treat these patients with therapies that would carry minimal toxicities and tremendous efficacy. But as you know, the story was uh, much more uh, you know, harder than, than uh, what we, we originally thought. And one by one, all of these trials went on to fail in recurrent disease. The sad thing is that 
or maybe the lucky thing for other diseases is that the majority of these drugs ended up being approved for other indications, but all of the trials in glioblastomas have failed. And more uh, uh, challenging is the fact that we're not really sure what is it about gliomas that uh, all of these drugs actually fail one after the other. Is that because we're targeting the wrong targets? Maybe they're not uh, sufficiently relevant for oncogenesis or there are too many feedback loops and redundant pathways. We're now more and more learning about temporal and spatial variations. Or is it because these are the wrong drugs and uh, we have problems you know, of achieving uh, adequate concentrations, especially for drugs that are not very potent, we do need to have better uh, blood brain barrier penetration because a lot of this microscopic disease is uh, behind uh, this, uh, an intact blood brain barrier. Also, we still don't know how to select patients for these trials. We are still not sure if we should select based on specific mutations or should we go through transcription subgroups or not do any selection whatsoever and treat a large number of patients and then identify the responders and then go after the phenotypes that predict response. So in other words, regardless of what we do, we certainly need to improve the translation components within our trials, improve the science before, during, and after the trial. And this is actually the paradigm that we have been following in our division. So the low-hanging fruit is to try to use the genomic information that is now widely available on these tumors to see if we can uh, improve our outcomes. So as you know, glioblastoma was the very first tumor sequenced by the TCGA effort. And since then, uh, gene sequencing has become the norm uh, when uh, managing these patients. And here, looking at all types of gliomas, and uh, these different colors here represent the different subtypes of gliomas. And you have no difficulty to see that uh, uh, the uh, genomic signatures are very distinct across the different histologies. You can see here the quintessential signature of the algodendo gliomas, which is one pianotin Q correlation, ID8 mutation, third promoter mutation, and CIC and FUPP1. And here's the quintessential signature of Astros with ID8 mutation, ATRX mutation or loss, uh, and TPG3 mutation. And here's this quintessential signatures of glioblastoma. Now we start to see EGFR amplification or mutation, P10 loss or mutation, and lots of remodelities in CDKs. So putting uh, those patients now, uh, arranging them into uh, what kind of pathways ended up uh, being abnormal in these tumors, we can see the vast majority of patients follow this cake recipe. So basically a, a tyrosine kinase uh, pathway with PIPK, AKT, mTOR pathway activation, and NF1. Uh, you see also a lot of these patients with uh, abnormality in the T53 pathway leading to uh, abnormalities in senescence and apoptosis. And uh, a lot of these patients having abnormalities in cell cycle control. But then when we put all of these patients uh, match it to actually which mutations have a track record of being drug abnormal, what you can see is unfortunately each of these mutations is actually very rare. Uh, we're not being very good at identifying drugs for those specific phenotypes. We heavily rely on basket trials, but unfortunately basket trials typically exclude patients with brain tumors. So we're left with no trials or very rare trials that address these questions. Uh, we do have some low-hanging fruits, of course, IDH mutation, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, but again, the message here is that uh, it is very difficult to run target therapy trials these days because you really uh, need to have strategies to tackle the rarity of each of these phenotypes. And adding to our challenges are how these tumors evolve over time and how uh, they are heterogeneous to begin with. So this is a patient, for example, that at diagnosis, uh, she was enrolled in one of my trials of a notch inhibitor, and she had a very typical signature of astrocytomas with IDH mutation, ATRX, and TP53 mutations, and several potential uh, target targetable abnormalities uh, uh, with other abnormalities uh, 
But uh, when this patient, uh, again, she received the uh, newly diagnosed uh, uh, trial, uh, and then when she recurred, uh, she was uh, operated on again, even though she had a very small tumor. And what we found is that all of those potentially targetable mutations are actually gone. We're seeing some passengers here, but the reality that what's driving this tumor now is actually probably abnormalities at the epigenetic level. And you can imagine that uh, if at this point in time of her disease, we were to enroll her in a clinical trial, most patients do not have another brain surgery to have another sequencing. So you go to archive tissue and we would have selected her for trials that probably were irrelevant for her at this point in time. Again, those abnormalities that we thought were present were actually gone. This is another example of uh, potentially targetable uh, mutations that actually were very different at the time of recurrence. And another difficult challenge are these patients here. So these are patients that we sort of created uh, this is uh, a result of the use of temozolomide that can cause mutations and mismatch repair genes, uh, typically MSH6. And what happens is that uh, these patients uh, with mismatch repair uh, defects start to accumulate in all of these mutations. And you can imagine that developing target therapies for these folks uh, is much harder. And uh, one of the surprising findings of our uh, studies have been that uh, these are actually much more common than we previously thought. So in moving forward, what we're trying to do is to, again, improve the science linked to the early development trials. So we more and more rely on phase zero trials to show us uh, if our drugs are actually getting into the brain especially in areas with intact blood-brain barrier. We also want to see if the, uh, the drugs are hitting their targets and we like to look at the pharmacodynamic effect in these resected specimens. We more and more have, we, we have to work with their companies to have basket trials that actually include patients with our rare phenotypes. Uh, there's a shift towards more newly diagnosed disease because uh, these are easier patients and uh, the genomics uh, information is actually fresh. And when we're dealing with recurrent disease, we typically like to resample, especially for target therapies, if anything, at least to exclude the hypermutator phenotype. And we also like to, of course, update the gene sequencing and the oncogenic trimers. Another trend in our field is try to target these trunk mutations, but that's not an easy task. And again, we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. But the vast majority of trials right now is actually trying to find alternative strategies that uh, address more stable targets. So the low hanging fruit of stable targets is actually immunotherapies. So uh, we do know that glioblastomas do grow in a very uh, immunosuppressive microenvironment. And uh, we have uh, identified several uh, immune checkpoints that seem to be very important in this disease. But on top of identifying the right immune checkpoint, we have the challenges of the anatomical location itself. So you can imagine that it's much harder to trigger an immunological response in the brain, which is you know, traditionally considered the so-called sanctuary site for the immune system. And we have to get these immune responses to act fast because these are tumors that grow very rapidly and they cause symptoms. And we don't have the luxury of waiting several months or years to uh, rehab the uh, benefits of the uh, immunotherapies. And of course, if you're triggering uh, inflammatory uh, responses in the brain, we have to deal with the risks of neurologic symptoms and neurotoxicity. And another important thing is uh, that this inflammation could potentially mimic tumor progression. So managing these patients can be challenging because we have to learn to how to recognize see the progression versus real tumor progression uh, on the MRI. But we did try, and uh, here you're looking at the very first results of the, uh, the very first phase one trial uh, utilizing uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors in glioblastoma, and this was done in, uh, with BMS, 
Uh, and in this trial, we treated 40 patients, uh, both with nivolumab or two combinations of nivolumab and ipilimumab. And what we found is that, yes, the target definitely was present in the majority of patients. So 68% of the patients had pdl one expression, but we didn't see any brain toxicities, which is good and perhaps bad because this could potentially reflect the fact that we're not achieving much. And the overall survival was very similar to historical controls, although some patients did seem to mount more of an immune response. But this went on to be tested in uh, randomized trials, and we're now reporting the, the final results of these trials. And one by one, they all failed to improve survival, both in newly diagnosed and recurrent disease. So we're not giving up on immunotherapies. So I think our task now is to try to understand what is that about the brain that in spite of pdl one expression, we're not seeing any uh, help from uh, anti-PD-1 or anti pd one therapies? And uh, I think for, for this question, uh, I think it is great to have a helping hand of people that study the uh, CNS uh, immunology. And uh, in this uh, project, what we did is to partner with Dr. David Halper and now, uh, also Liliana Luca to look at how can we actually come up with better uh, immune checkpoint inhibition that is relevant uh, for, uh, for this microenvironment. And what the Halfers lab came up with is that uh, this uh, immune checkpoint called TIGIT seems to be much more relevant in the brain. Uh, it was very interesting that in their studies, they found a lot of TIGIT expression in DBMs and uh, not so much digit expression in the quintessential inflammatory disease, which is multiple sclerosis. And uh, they went on to uh, perform several studies uh, utilizing single cell sequencing that sort of confirmed that uh, T cell dysfunction was being driven uh, by digit in, in this particular disease. So to test this hypothesis in patients, we designed this clinical trial where we're looking at uh, uh, different cohorts of patients prior to surgery where they will be treated with either anti tigit or anti-PD-1 or the combination or placebo. And then these patients will be brought to surgery and then we will uh, do uh, uh, tumor uh, single cell RNA sequencing with 10X uh, as well as some uh, studies to uh, produce some uh, spatial validation of the findings. And uh, we'll also follow these patients longitudinally to see uh, if we can monitor what's happening in the tumor uh, by analyzing uh, the T cells in the periphery. So it's a very exciting trial. So uh, I wish we had started the development of anti-PD-1 this way by understanding the science before going to uh, more or, or larger uh, studies that would end up being negative. But we're very excited about this mechanism of action. Also, it is important to emphasize that uh, this combination of anti tgit and anti-PD-1 is very hot in the field right now. As you know, it is already in phase three in non-small cell lung cancer, and we're very excited uh, to bring this trial uh, here to Yale. Also, to understand a little bit more of the immune system, we need uh, good models uh, that are immunocompetent. And one of the uh, uh, richness uh, of our environment here is uh, Dr. Siri Chen's work uh, producing uh, these uh, gem models of glioblastomas where he can pretty much produce avatars for all of these phenotypes that I just showed you. And one of the ideas here is to see how these different phenotypes respond to these different immunotherapies. So this is very exciting data, which again illustrates how we can concomitantly to the development uh, in the clinic to also try to understand uh, these treatments in parallel uh, in the lab. Now, another barrier for, uh, for the development of effective uh, immune responses is uh, the work being done by uh, the Iwasaki's lab. So uh, Akiko uh, has been uh, working with Eric Song and Jono Tomas, and uh, she has recently had this uh, nature paper where they showed that uh, uh, there is a defective uh, lymphatic drainage from the brain uh, that you can correct utilizing VEGFC. So in her models, the, the combination of VEGFC and anti-PD-1 actually improved survival. And uh, it was also interesting that they also do some experiments by injecting uh, anti-PD-1 directly into the uh, CSF uh, 
and also the results seem to be better than uh, systemic administration of anti-PD-1. So this is all uh, giving rise to uh, another generation of clinical trials and, and some new compounds that we hope to bring to clinic in the mid term. Now also again, uh, another important barrier uh, in, in, in many solid tumors, but particularly in gliomas, is the role of tumor associated microphages and how they produce these immune suppressive tumor marking products. And one of the ways that we uh, could potentially uh, intervene in this was discovered by Anne Eichmann here at Yale, where she's looking at uh, the role of the SLIT2 Robo1 signaling, which seems to attract and polarize uh, tumor associated microphages in, in the brain microenvironment and glioblastoma microenvironment. And when she did experiments to knock down SLIT2 or to block this pathway, she uh, achieved better immune responses. And in combination with anti PD1, she had uh, a really significant improvement in survival uh, in this tumor bearing mice. So the idea here is now to generate anti robo nanobodies. Uh, one of the barriers for that would be then uh, how can we get these nanobodies to penetrate into the brain? And since she's very resourceful, she has the answer. Uh, it looks like uh, if you block uh, antibodies, uh, if you use antibodies blocking this receptor called UNC5B, you can sort of produce an on-demand blood-brain barrier opening. Uh, so this lasts a few hours and it's great for drugs up to 40 kilodaltons. So the idea here is that uh, if this is successful, we could combine this, these agents with many of the chemotherapies and other target therapies that we are trying to use to treat these patients in a more efficient way and overcome the problem of uh, blood brain barrier penetration. So very exciting work that we hope to see more of. Now, moving on into, uh, st still sticking to tumor marking barrier, but moving on to partnerships with uh, pharma. Uh, one of the, our partnerships is with this drug uh, with, with this company called Nano Pharmaceuticals. Uh, and uh, these folks have discovered a novel receptor with, within the alpha V beta 3 integrin that is targeted by this uh, FP, uh, PMT drug that seems to have an amazing activity in their mouse models, really melting the mice. And uh, this was the first, uh, now, now we're now designing the first uh, in human trial here at Yale that will start in a couple of months. But uh, to understand this better, we did bring uh, Yale labs into the mix to better define how is this drug really working and who are the best candidates by understanding a little bit more about the effects on cell invasion, uh, signaling networks and gene expression. So one of the assays that uh, we're utilizing in partnership with Andrei Levchenko is uh, looking at these, the use of his uh, integrated platform uh, which is the so-called race assay, which is this rapid analysis of cell phenotype extremes, where he uses the cell migration as a uh, surrogate marker of tumor aggressiveness. And, uh, and, and then uh, you can test the multiple drugs uh, utilizing this assay uh, as a form of uh, drug screening. And he's applying this drug to this with very interesting results. And we hope to then identify partners, which are the best uh, genomic candidates, uh, and then uh, see if we can optimize the trial as we go by enriching uh, with either best candidates or potentially novel combinations. So again, that's just to illustrate that it is very important to uh, really uh, involve our laboratories, even in uh, trials that are being conducted by pharma. Now, sticking again, now, now moving on to other uh, more stable targets, and one of them is IDH mutation. And uh, this story uh, came out of uh, Dr. Bindra's lab, where he found that IDH mutations uh, change DNA repair through uh, the production of 2-hydroxybutyrate, uh, which is the byproduct of this mutation. And this results in sort of a that then can be targeted by PARP inhibitors. So he has several clinical trials with these PARP inhibitors. And uh, we're now hoping uh, to see if this will actually uh, improve outcomes uh, for, for these patients. Also again, sticking to the DNA repair theme, uh, 
we recently uh, submitted a, uh, a U19 led by Mayo Clinic and John, uh, Jen Sarkaria uh, in partnership with Eva Galanis, Dr. Bindra and I. So we have two projects. One is uh, trying to optimize MDM2 inhibition for these patients and ATR in, in inhibition for these patients. And this uh, will again bring two other phase zero slash one clinical trials uh, to our portfolio, hopefully soon. Now we don't have time to review all of our portfolio, uh, but we do have partnerships with industry for opening other trials to fill in gaps in our portfolio. Dr. Blondin uh, has activated the Agile trial, which is a multi-drug, uh, uh, multi-arm clinical trial that is uh, happening worldwide. So we have uh, access to these drugs for our patients. We have a bunch of other trials, but the theme here is really to focus on early therapeutic development and then participate in NCI cooperative group studies for those extremely rare phenotypes, for example, BRF mutant craniofringiomas, which again, very difficult to find patients. And uh, for those, we do need to partner uh, with other uh, places around the country. And I could go on and on talking about all of the Yale science that is going in uh, brain tumors. Uh, I, I select a few stores that are closest to clinic, but all of these people uh, in this picture and many others uh, that I'm not even mentioning today uh, are producing amazing science that we can actually use into our portfolio and bring it uh, in, a, in, in more, let's say, intelligent trials ranging from data science to neuroimaging and all sorts of therapeutic approaches. So in conclusion, so we are lucky enough to have this unique breadth of scientific expertise uh, our focus is really on investigating shaded trials uh, that are uh, homegrown. And our other focus is on early stage development with pharma partners, but also uh, bringing along our own labs. Immunocology and DNA repair have emerged as leading teams. But here there we have many patents, although many are not ready for clinical application and need a lot of help for development. We certainly need more work on existing available drugs, for example, coming from CTEF and pharma, and a lot of work on functional genomics so that we can figure out finally how to target these undruggable targets. With that, I'd like to uh, finish by thank you all of the people. So when we talk clinical trials, really the merit is all of others, of the labs, of the, all of the infrastructure, uh, I would also like to acknowledge our uh, division uh, uh, attendings and uh, APPs who are actually managing treating these patients on the trials. Uh, I would like to thank again the CTO staff. They're going through rough times, but uh, Roy Decker is navigating and it's going to get us out of this situation. A big thank to the PRC reviewers because one of my hats is actually as the PRC chair uh, and uh, we, uh, we acknowledge along with Barbara Burtness that uh, there's a lot of work that goes into this and uh, I would like to thank them publicly at this opportunity. Lots of thanks to YCCI that helped us with uh, investigating shared clinical trials, all of the people that have been enabling this research. And finally, a big thank to the YCC and Smile Leadership with Laura Pickens, Kevin Vest, Kevin Winsley, and now Nita, who all understand the importance of our clinical trials portfolio. Last but not least, again, I would like to uh, thank the Schoenberg family for their generous gift. Uh, in fact, then I'm not gonna talk about this today because we're still uh, working on the details, but the word is out that we receive a generous gift from that foundation. And we're hoping to put together uh, a nice program that will again, uh, enable and expand on uh, our research efforts. Thank you very much. And I'll take some questions if you have time. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Antonio. Very interesting work. Um, are there any questions that people want to enter into the chat? Um, while we're waiting, I have a quick question. Um, you mentioned this idea of opening up the, the blood-brain barrier by targeting a molecule. Um, is it worth going back to some of the earlier drugs that weren't terribly effective to see that, whether or not that might help them uh, work better? Yes, I think there is a whole uh, list of uh, drugs that perhaps will need to be revisited. Uh, although most of these drugs would actually 
be again in rare phenotypes because I think those are, we still need to select them by the, those specific mutations. The problem of copy number remains regardless of blood brain penetration. I don't think blood brain barrier penetration was the reason why we couldn't target EGFR amplification or P10 loss. I think that is a different question. But if we are to even answer those, we still need the, this kind of approach because it, it makes our lives much easier. Um, are there any questions from the audience? I was also struck by the, the lots of different mutations upon recurrence you showed. Um, uh, what is that thought to be due to? Is just a, a high proliferation rate of these tumors? Uh, yeah, well, I think, so first of all, these tumors are very heterogeneous to begin with, right? So these are clones that were there to begin with. Uh, but it looks like the treatment process ends up eliminating a lot of the so-called cancer-associated mutations and other unknown mutations emerge. And also a lot of these are actually uh, epigenetic changes. So there's a whole you know, line of research trying to then understand this. And uh, Mark Bunnells are interested in, in that line of research and other labs to see how we can target these tumors at recurrence that are sort of you know, very simple from a, a genomic standpoint, but not so simple at the epigenetic level. Sure, okay. Well, thank you very much. Very interesting. Uh, we have to move on because we have the second speaker. Um, and our second speaker today uh, climbed down from the hill, from Science Hill, is Seth Herzon, who's a Milton Harris professor of chemistry, um, received his PhD at Harvard and then postdoc at University of Illinois. And he's interested in um, uh, natural products uh, particular products that uh, affect the synthesis or uh, damage DNA. Um, and he's received numerous multiple uh, Young Investigator Awards and working with Jason Crawford is a terrific collaboration looking at the, the metabolites made by the human microbiota and identified some of them that actually damage DNA and therefore contribute to cancer. So um, Seth, we're looking forward to hearing about your work. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Dan. Um, thanks for the introduction. And uh, thanks to all, to everyone for the invitation to come and for attending the lecture. Um, I will talk today about work we've been doing in the human microbiome, but actually, you know, I was calling on Abernab because we created against drug resistant, uh, TMZ resistant GBMs that we're very excited about. Um, but uh, that will be a story for another day. Um, and so, right, so today I'll, I'll talk about a project that's been ongoing in my group for about six years. And we've been looking to understand the molecular basis um, of a carcinogenic phenotype that was observed um, from, from certain gut bacteria. So, I'll go through sort of the sequence of events to kind of outline, sequence of discoveries to outline the problem. And so in 2006, this was the paper that set off a lot of interest in this area. Um, Eric Oswald and, and, and coworkers identified um, certain strains of commensal and pathogenic E. coli that had a uh, biosynthetic gene cluster known as the CLB cluster. So, um, by that, I mean uh, that uh, gene genetic locus uh, contains uh, the coding for enzymes that make a secondary metabolite. And he took these CLB containing bacteria and did a transient infection of HeLa cells with them, and then looked at the effect on those cells. And he found that they underwent uh, cell cycle arrest, uh, megalocytosis, and using a comet assay and other gamma H2AX, he, he saw that they accumulated double strand breaks in their DNA. Um, and so this is a very interesting phenotype. It's not the first time uh, microbes have you know, produced genotoxins, uh, but it was, was, um, was a very interesting example. And I'll come to in a second why, it, why it's attracted so much attention. Um, Subsequent to that report, there's been numerous studies 
uh, trying to ascertain whether or not there's a role for these bacteria in colorectal cancer uh, formation. And um, from the same group in 2010, it was shown that in, uh, in, in uh, intestinal loop models um, of, uh, of, of mice that were infected with CLB bacteria, they observed DNA damage in vivo, they observed gamma H2AX, um, they observed uh, increased mutations in the HPRT and TK loci, and then also hyperproliferation uh, following exposure uh, to the bacteria. So they seem to be driving uh, tumorigenesis. And then there were subsequent studies following up, looking at similar types of in vivo effects. So using IL uh, knockout mice, it was shown that infection with these bacteria leads to a higher rate of, of, of tumor formation. Um, and then there were three groups that did meta-analyses of, um, of uh, fecal samples from, G from CRC patients. And what we find is that about 60 to 70% of CRC patients uh, have these bacteria. And that's, and that's versus about 20% uh, in, in the healthy population. And the other sort of bit is that the preponderance of these bacteria tracks with the severity of, of, of the cancer. So people with more advanced CRC were at the high end of that correlation, whereas people with early stage CRC were more at the lower end. Um, and so um, it wasn't really until last year that a causal relationship was unequivocally established. There were two studies um, from Mayer and then uh, Boxdell and Cleavers. And in the cleaver study, they generated um, an organoid and infected that organoid chronically uh, for about three or four months uh, with the uh, CLB positive uh, bacteria. And what they showed is that you get a mutational signature uh, transformation and proliferation we also find that that mutational signature is found, um, is enriched in, in, in CRC patients as well. And so um, the Mayer study came to similar conclusions. And essentially these two papers, you know, this is a rare example in the microbiome where you actually establish causation. So these two papers brought this phenotype to, to sort of a causal uh, level. Um, and what my lab has been trying to do, of course, is understand the molecular basis for all of this, okay? And so um, uh, Oswald in his initial paper had done a series of very nice and, and you know, robust control experiments to establish that this genotoxic phenotype is due to the final biosynthetic product, product of the CLB cluster. In other words, if one modifies any of the enzymes in the CLB pathway, you lose this genotoxic phenotype, okay? And so the implication then is that it's the fully elaborated molecule that is the active toxin, not something in route to another, another product. Um, and we call that molecule cholebactin. And so, the field basically set out to do what we do best, which is isolate compounds. And um, the classic way of, of isolating uh, natural products, secondary metabolites, is to culture your organism of interest. In the case of uh, you know, bacterial secondary metabolite, you might grow it in liquid culture, grow it on scale, uh, extract, start to fractionate by HPLC. And then we typically do what's known as activity guided fractionation, where you're essentially testing each of these fractions for a particular phenotype. And then you keep purifying and testing and purifying and testing until you get to a single compound and you characterize it. The problem is that this approach does not work for cholebactin. Okay, so the molecule is very unstable, it is very difficult to get the bacteria to express the CLB pathway ex vivo. And what we find is that because of the 
you know, primarily anaerobic environment of the gut, the molecule actually undergoes oxidative degradation when you attempt to isolate it sort of on the bench under air. And just to, to um, give you an example of how challenging this is, this is not work from our own laboratory. This is a group at, at Berkeley and Scripps. Um, they've been pursuing cholebactin and they isolated this uh, molecule here in 2019 they obtained 50 micrograms from a 2000 liter fermentation, if anyone can imagine that. So we're talking about literally vanishingly small quantities. Um, and they, they advanced this molecule as a candidate cholebactin. And unfortunately this was derived from a triple mutant Frankenstein-like bacteria. And I wrote a commentary if you're interested on this. I, we, the general thinking in the field is this is probably not relevant to the genotoxic phenotype, um, but the point is these are the links that people are willing to go to to try and isolate these molecules. Um, and so how did we approach this? So, so as Dan mentioned, we've been collaborating with Jason Crawford. Jason is uh, one of the leaders in understanding cholebactin biosynthesis. And so what we've been doing is really taking knowledge from the biosynthetic pathway and trying to infer what types of substructures might be within cholebactin itself and how those might interact uh, with DNA. And so one of the sort of models that came out of these biosynthetic studies is that you have these fully linear products offloaded from the PKS assembly line. There's a serine protease that removes this residue in blue, this acyl asparagine residue, that generates a primary amine. And once you form that, that can start to wrap up and ultimately lead to this compound on the bottom here, which has a cyclopropane ring in conjugation with a, with a, with a alpha beta unsaturated amine. And for those in the audience that have worked with genotoxins, um, you know that uh, these electrophilic cyclopropanes are, 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 are not uh, uncommon. This is a, a sort of a pharmacophore that's found in a variety of genotoxic natural products. Um, and so this was, you know, sort of very logically following from that type of precedent. The problem is that, the problem is this, no one had isolated these imines, no one had any spectroscopic data on them. All we had was this, this kind of this mechanistic hypothesis. And so we set out to make it, and um, I'm not going to have time to go through all of the synthetic work that, that went into developing these roots, but um, the key steps are shown here. So we start from this linear precursor, and what we find is that if we concentrate this down from dilute acid, we can get this um, uh, carbamate nitrogen to condense onto the ketone. You form this vanilligous imid. We then do amide bond formation deprotect the Bach group to get to this compound on the left. We isolate this as, as its TFA salt, but if you neutralize this, it snaps shut. And so this carbon attacks this ketone, you lose water and you form that imine. And uh, the assay that we use, that's because it's, it's nice to give this a lot of detail. It's inexpensive, it's fast, is, is a, uh, um, uh, taking linearized plasmid DNA, incubating with the molecule, uh, running a denaturing gel. And um, basically, if you look at the right-hand lanes here, you see these streaks on the gel going down to about 100 nanomolar. What that tells us is that at, at 100 nanomolar concentration of this compound, we're getting extensive degradation of the DNA. These are smaller fragments that have higher mobility um, on the gel. And so that was very exciting to us. Um, and you know, we hypothesized again that it was this uh, nucleotide addition to the cyclopropane that was leading to this degradation of the DNA. And so to probe that in a little bit more detail, uh, we made a couple of control compounds. So the first one was this dimeric structure up top here. And so the hypothesis is that if this is alkylating DNA, perhaps we can induce twofold alkylation, and perhaps uh, we can then detect an interstrand crosslink. And 
Um, when you incubate with that compound, indeed, you can see down here a cross-linked band. This corresponds to our positive control for cross-linking cisplatin. And then the other thing we did was we made a negative control where we took that cyclopropane and converted it to a gem dimethyl uh, substituent. The hypothesis being if the cyclopropane is truly involved, this compound should be inactive and going up to half millimolar, we don't detect any damage in our assay. And so um, without characterizing the products, without even having isolated the natural products, we were able to sort of formulate this proposal for how these things might be might be alkylating DNA. Um, and we, I, you know, we sort of at that point got stuck. So that was around 2018. We, and we had identified this, you know, this DNA reactive substructure in the molecule. We knew that it was incomplete. In other words, there were other functional groups, other rings and, and things within cholebactin, uh, but we didn't know what they were. And as I mentioned in the beginning, the you know the classical isolation approach is not very successful in this in this context, and so we were stuck until this paper came out. And so this is also from the Oswald group. They did a beautiful experiment where they took the cholebactin producing bacteria, grew them up in liquid media, added exogenous DNA, isolated that DNA following an incubation, and ran a denaturing gel. And the point is that they observed inner strand crosslinks um, in that DNA that was exposed to these bacteria. Okay. And so I have a note here at the bottom to remind me, you know, if you're paying attention, the original phenotype, phenotype was double strand breaks. Now I'm talking about crosslinks. Those two um, lesions are, are, are intimately related. And I'll talk about that at the end if there's time. Um, but basically, we're very excited about this paper because. Um, you can imagine that cholebactin is entrained in that crosslink, right? You know, if, if, if that's what's causing the crosslink. That, that point wasn't completely certain yet either. But, but assuming that it is, all we have to do, all we have to do is, is isolate that crosslink and characterize it. Um, and so at this point in time, you know, 90% of the biosynthetic pathway had been mapped out. We had a very good understanding um, of what went in of the amino acids that went into the pathway and where they ended up um, following sort of offloading of the biosynthetic products. And so, for example, um, it was known through work uh, that Jason did very early on and then others um, that this aminocyclopropane comes from a thionine and these thiazole rings uh, derive from cysteine, okay? And so what this allowed us to do is conduct essentially isotope labeling experiments where we generated oxytrophic strains, either deficient in methionine or cysteine biosynthesis, and then supplemented those cultures with C13 labeled amino acid, okay? And so we can take the wild type strain, the oxytrophs with their amino acids, incubate, here we're using linearized PUC19 DNA. We can run a gel to verify that we got cross-linking and then we can try and isolate that cross-link and characterize it. And um, one of the things that's worth pointing out is that to do these assays, we're talking about 250 microliters of culture versus 2000 liters uh, you know, using the old, the sort of the old fashioned method. And so to give you an idea of what the data looks like and why we do this isotope labeling, I'll show you this slide. So um, for example, we can spot these ions that I've uh, marked in colored boxes here. And the top chromatogram is the wild type strain. And what you can see in the cysteine oxytroph, the middle graph is that those ions are shifted by three units. And so that's very useful to us because it tells us two things. One is that that ion is, is probably contains cholebactin or, or the vestiges of cholebactin. And then two, it contains one uh, thiazole residue. There was one cysteine incorporated into that unit. Um, and we can play the same game with the methionine oxytroph. So here we get a shift by plus four. So that tells us there's one, one amino cyclopropane and tells us it's also related to cholebactin, okay? So this was the initial work that we did. 
we had to um, carry out a lot more labeling in order to um, get at the full structure assignment. And so um, what we did was we generated a series of, we had our cysteine and methionine oxytroph. We generated styrene and glycine oxytrophs because those are also incorporated into the, into the natural product. And then we also did universal labeling, uh, C13 labeling with glucose, N15 labeling with ammonium chloride. And we can run the same experiment where we incubate with the DNA, isolate the crosslink, digest it, analyze it by tandem MS. And we can then see different shifts in those ions. And this data turned out to be very powerful for us because without isolating the compound, without getting any spectroscopic data, we can, we can glean an incredible amount of insight into the molecule structure. So from the glucose labeling, we get a shift by 37 units. That tells us, of course, that it has 37 carbons. Uh, ammonia shifts by eight units. We have eight nitrogens. We can see that um, in the methionine oxytroph, and I'm talking about a higher molecular weight ion here at the top, uh, we get a shift by eight carbons. And so that told us that we had two of these cyclopropane residues or what was left of them, um, two uh, thiazole rings based on a six carbon shift in the, in the cysteine oxytroph, you get the idea. And so we can basically tease out a lot of structural data um, to sort of, you know, see what pieces are need to be put together here to, to make the molecule. And so at any rate, we found this higher molecular weight ion at 956. Using all of that data, we were able to fit it to this structure here. And so it contains um, one adenine residue, and I've explicitly drawn the adenine without connectivity to the base because at the time that we did this, we couldn't specify where it was bonded to adenine. We now uh, know that that's N3. Um, but uh, it had one adenine. On the right-hand side, you have a cyclopropane. That's still intact, okay? And then you've got the rest of the core molecule sort of linking it together. And so it's, it's almost C2 symmetric. It's, it's a heterodimer. It's not quite C2 symmetric. If you look carefully at these thiazole rings, they have different appendages and different connectivity, but it's very close, okay? And this structure fit our MS data within one ppm. So we're very excited about that. Um, and so if that is simply a monoadenine adapt and we're getting ICLs, presumably, there's a dinucleotide adduct, and we went and we were able to find the diadenine adduct, okay? And uh, this fits, uh, fits within a half ppm error, okay? And so working backwards, if that's the diadenine adduct, then um, this is the structure of cholebactin on the bottom here, okay? And so we've got two cyclopropanes, and in the middle, we have this one, two dicarbonyl uh, residue. Okay. Um, there's a detail here which is worth mentioning, which is that this is this kind of compound on the bottom is what we characterized. Um, what we expect based on the biosynthetic pathway is this alpha amino ketone at the top. Um, but we've done work that's shown that this thing is unstable towards aerobic oxidation to an alpha ketoimmune and then hydrolysis to a one, two diketone. And so um, working under air on the bench, this is, this is the compound that you would have expected to get. Um, and so, so no one's isolated cholebactin yet. And so how do you prove the structure assignment? We can go back and try and make it. And so we spent some time uh, developing a synthesis of the molecule and um, it, was, it was not straightforward because of its instability, but we could make it. And then we can do an LCMS co-injection and we see that it has the same retention time. It has the same uh, tandem MS as the, uh, as the um, natural material. And then finally, we did a cross-linking assay where we basically ran that same experiment that we ran with the bacteria uh, except replace the bacteria with our compound. And so this thing will crosslink at up to about, you know, down to about 500 nanomolar. And then um, 
we can do the tandem MS analysis of those cross links. And so <clears throat> let me explain what's on this slide. So when we do the bacterial experiment where we treat the DNA with the bacteria, we can isolate the cross link. You then run tandem MS, you get a whole list of ions, of primary and secondary and tertiary ions that you see from those cross links. And so, you know, the argument is if we're making the same molecule that the bugs are making, uh, our synthetic compound ought to interact with DNA in the same way, and it ought to blow apart in a mass spec in the same way. And so what this plot shows on the x-axis are all of the ions that we found in the tandem, tandem MS of the bacteria-derived crosslinks. We see all of those ions with our synthetic material. And the y-axis is simply the uh, experimental minus theoretical error for those ions uh, using the synthetic material. And so the point is, um, we get all the same ions that we get when we use the bacteria. They're all with, within, with the exception of one, within two ppm. Okay. And so we don't have an NMR of coebactin to compare to, but we can say that the structure that we made interacts with DNA, it crosslinks DNA, and then it blows apart in a, in a tandem MS and exactly an indistinguishable fashion. And so um, what about this ICL DSB, you know, apparent contradiction? So there's been a lot of debate in the literature uh, between, uh, you know, debating the mechanism of action because Oswald had originally observed DNA double strand breaks using a, a comet assay and then came along and said, no, wait, it's cross links. And for any of you that are, are familiar with these repair pathways, you know that these two phenotypes are intimately linked, right? And so when you start to repair an ICL, you actually form a DSB that leads to activation of HR. And so you're gonna see gamma H2AX, you're gonna see streaking in your comet assay. And so um, the two phenotypes are entirely consistent. And we actually identified a, another pathway, which is just a spontaneous pathway. So it's well known in the old sort of genotoxin literature that N3 adenine adducts are unstable towards depyrination. And if we run our cross-linking assay, uh, we sort of, we modified the assay to be able to sort of get at this data. But this is, the conclusion is essentially that these, these ICLs undergo a slow depyrination. And then uh, there's a second elimination of the phosphate that occurs to lead to a single strand break. And you can imagine then, you know, in tandem with the repair pathways and also um, other alkylation lesions, eventually you're going to get those single strand breaks close enough to each other to get a double strand break. Um, and so this brings us to where we're at in the project. And so um, what we're currently doing is, is working with this molecule on the bottom here. And this is not colibactin itself. It is a analog of colibactin, the differences are highlighted in green. And so the diketone in colibactin on the top here is very unstable. You can't work with this compound. Um, it would be, you know, a sufficient task to try and use this in a series of assays to, to examine its sort of cellular um, activity. And so we made what we call the desdiketone analog on the bottom and working with Christian Jobin at the University of Florida, Christian's been basically taking this compound through all of the assays that have been run um, by, uh, by uh, Oswald and Boxtel and Cleavers and others looking at the genotoxic phenotype of the bacteria and seeing if, if, if the molecule recapitulates it. And up until now, it, it, it seems to. So we see we get activation again at H2AX, fan CD2. Um, what he's doing right now is basically looking to see if this induces the same type of mutational signature that one gets uh, with the bacteria. And that will be, you know, sort of the end, the end point. Uh, hopefully, you know, it will be a positive result, but uh, whatever it is, that will be sort of the end point uh, uh, for this. And so I just acknowledge all the people that did the work. I'll just go through this quickly to save time, but this is my collaborator, Jason. Many of you know him. Many people from my group contributed uh, to this project over the years. Acknowledge the uh, NCI and Yale uh, for funding. Thanks again for the invitation and 
I'm happy to stay on and take any questions you have. Uh, thank you, Seth. Very interesting. It makes me appreciate that I'm a molecular biologist. It's not nowhere near as hard as being a chemist, I think. Are there, um, are there questions for, for Seth? Yeah, I, I have one question. Of course, DNA um, damaging agents um, can cause cancer, but they're also used to treat cancer. Is there any thought, is there a possibility of using these compounds therapeutically? Absolutely, yeah. There's something we're very excited about. So I didn't get into it. You know, one of the challenges that we, in my group is always the chemistry, you know, is the chemistry work, is it general? The chemistry to make these molecules is very robust. And we started to characterize them uh, with Ranjit Bindra's lab. And he's found that in BRCA2 mutants, these things are hyperactive. And so that's the immediate direction we're going in. Uh, Long-term, we're looking to see if we can you know, optimize the properties of, of these molecules a little bit more. You know, it's more than just another cross-linker because I didn't get into it, but there's a mechanism by which we can cage the activity of the molecule and potentially target it. And so um, there's a lot, yeah, there's a lot that we can do. And, and that's sort of the phase that we're entering into with the project. Terrific. Um, we are after one o'clock. Um, so if people have other questions for Seth, just email him, I'm sure be happy to talk and thank both speakers for a really uh, stimulating talk today. Thank okay, you. Thanks everyone.